Great, let's get started. Um, thank you so much uh, everyone for coming and giving up uh, some time in your busy days uh, to join us um, at this open hour. We're here to talk about uh, the uh, role that we're currently recruiting for at JRF um, for the um, Associate Director role in our Emerging Futures team. So um, hopefully that's the reason you're all here. Um, you'll see already that we are hosting this as a webinar. Um, so all of the your cameras and mics are off. It's a slightly strange situation here for us. We can't see you. And actually, we don't know uh, who's here because, um, as we said uh, in uh, all the documents about this, this is uh, an, anon an anonymous space. Um, and so you're able to participate uh, without revealing your identity and also able to ask questions um, in that way as well. Anyway, it's very nice to have you all here. Um, so my name's Sophia Parker and I'm the Emerging Futures Director. Um, also on uh, the call today, um, we've got Paul Kissack, uh, who's our Group Chief Executive. Paul, give us a wave. And we've also got Seppi Nuhi, who is the Research and Partnerships Manager on the Emerging Futures team. Seppi, give us a wave as well, please. And um, I should also acknowledge that there are a couple of people behind the scenes who've been very uh, instrumental uh, in getting us set up for today. So big thanks to uh, Michelle and Joe. You won't see them, uh, but they are uh, doing some of the tech today and also will be working to kind of uh, group uh, and manage the questions that are coming in from all of you. So thanks to them. Um, just in terms of how we're gonna use our time. So we've got an hour. Um, in a minute, I'm going to hand over to Paul and ask him to say a little bit about uh, the JRF uh, and our uh, newly restated mission. Um, I'll then talk uh, some more about the Emerging Futures Programme, um, what the shape of it is, how we've been developing it over the last 12 months. Um, I'll then hand over to Seppi, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the experience of working at JRF. Uh, and then we'll, uh, I'll conclude uh, my comments by saying a bit about uh, the team, the role and the process um, for applying, if you are still interested at the end of all of that. Um, the, you're, you're welcome to submit questions at any point. Um, please make sure um, you do tick uh, the uh, anonymous option. Um, and uh, yeah, as I say, do please feel free to pose questions as I'm talking. Um, we do have a lot of people on the call today. Um, I don't know how many questions we're gonna get, but we may need to be pragmatic about kind of grouping those and making sure um, that we try and kind of cover the themes. So um, if you don't have your specific question answered, um, don't worry, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to answer sort of something that is similar. If uh, at the end of this, you feel you still haven't had your questions answered, um, you're welcome to drop us a line and we'll do our best to cover any questions we don't get to today. Um, I think that's everything. Um, so Paul, over to you. Thanks, Sophia, um, and thank you to everybody who's joined the, um, the webinar. It's quite a strange experience because I can see there are a lot of people out there, but I have no idea who who's there um, or what questions might come our way, but it's really good to be um, talking uh, with you. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about um, the foundation as a whole, the JRF, um, and where we've got to thinking about our mission for the years ahead um, uh, before Sophia talks a bit more about how the Emerging Futures Programme sits within that. Um, we are a social change organisation with an anchor interest in poverty and solving poverty. And uh, as we sort of come together today, we are doing so at a point where we know that there are well over 7 million families across the country who are currently struggling to afford the essentials of life, whether that's heating, whether it's eating, whether it's basic toiletries, um, who are getting into debt and arrears and are struggling at the sharp end of a really big crisis. But um, whilst the media will often portray this as a sort of passing cost of living crisis that will go away, in reality, we know this is a lens into some deeper and more long-standing challenges. And really what we are looking at is uh, many years, decades, in fact, of social and economic failure, which is um, coming to bear. So we've seen two decades of uh, increases in the number of people in this country living in deep poverty, uh, even faster growth in levels of uh, destitution. Um, we haven't seen meaningful uh, improvements in living standards for a lot of people for um, over a decade and a half. Um, we are seeing that um, manifest itself in all sorts of health challenges, both physical and mental health challenges, some of which are being played out um, you know, in the media as we speak um, in the National Health Service at the moment. Um, uh, and then we have sort of huge underpinning shifts, which as a society and as an economy, we are struggling to get to grips with, be they um, technological, whether demographic around the aging population, 
um, whether they are facing up to the climate emergency, which is, of course, the biggest threat um, and challenge we face um, uh, in the planet. Um, and we also know that for all of these challenges, deep challenges, which affect many people, they affect some more than others, people who are um, trapped into those challenges through more systemic and structural uh, barriers, um, whether they're around ethnicity and race, whether they're about disability or whether about um, other structural and systemic um, challenges to equity in our country. So we've got some really, really big, deep challenges as a country. It's perhaps not surprising that as a result of that, we are seeing increasing levels of pessimism and fatalism. Uh, over half of all British people feel that young people growing up in Britain today will actually live a worse life than, um, that, that young people will live a worse life than they did. Um, now, at JRF, um, we do not want to be a, an organisation of despair. Um, we are an organisation of hope and solutions um, and looking to the future. And our mission has uh, has very much focused on that. What we actually believe is that we shouldn't be tinkering around the edges. Um, we should be looking to support a deeper transition that we either are in or should be in a period of deeper and more radical transition to new social and economic models. Um, and that's what our new mission statement, which I hope Michelle might be able to put up on the screen now, um, seeks to set out that we are looking to support and speed up the transition to a more equitable uh, and just future, free from poverty, in which people and planet can flourish. So we spent some time over the last year or so working with our trustees, working with many people outside the organisation to think about uh, that mission and what that might mean uh, in our current context. And um, in doing so, we've focused in on some important principles, some important ways of working, things which will help to define the culture, behaviours of our organisation, the way we work. And if Michelle is able to move us on to the next screen, it will set those out. And I won't go through these in detail, and um, they're, they're available um, publicly, and I'm uh, very happy, as I'm sure Sophia will be, to answer questions on them, but, but very briefly running through them. So the first around horizons, this is a recognition that we need to work across different horizons. So we need to take urgent action now um, to mitigate the worst effects of some of the poverty that I've, and destitution I've just described. But this is not a job of tinkering at the edges of a system. We also need to be shaping longer term um, change and, and that deeper structural transition I mentioned. Linked to that is the question of power. So we do as an organization engage with where most political power lies now. So we do engage with um, the government of the day, but we also recognize that we need to be supporting those who are furthest from power and seeking to share some of the power that we have um, and use our position of relative privilege and wealth to, um, to support those who, are, who can feel most powerless and furthest away from the center of power um, in the work that uh, we do. And that closely links to the question of equity as it says, we bring the lens of equity and liberation to our work. We focus on where there is structural disadvantage and seek to break that down. And um, we think about that not just in terms of our own work, but in terms of the very nature of philanthropy. We ask ourselves how far that actually, as an organization, are we part of the problem? And how do we shift away from that? They're not easy questions for an organization, any organization to ask. Um, but we've got a set of trustees uh, and a team here who are keen to ask those difficult questions. Um, we have a particular focus on becoming an anti-racist organization. Again, a set of difficult questions for us to ask both about our history and our present and our future, about the way we work, the sort of organization we are. And we don't propose that we have simple and straightforward and easy answers to that, but we're on um, a journey and we are um, looking for the ways in which we can move ourselves along that journey. Um, on risk, um, we recognize very much we have a position of um, privilege. We are a relatively wealthy and independent organization. And as such, it's very easy for organizations like this to feel comfortable and relaxed and complacent. And we cannot afford to do that um, if we are to embark on the kind of deep and difficult work that we need to do. Um, there is no room for complacency, no room for a low risk appetite. So quite often we will be asking ourselves, is the, is the work we're doing risky enough? 
Um, not as some organizations would, is this too risky for us, but is this risky enough? Because if it's not, perhaps we're not playing the part that we should be. On infrastructure, this is really about uh, getting into a mindset where we, we're not seeking profile for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. We don't have to raise funds. We're not seeking income as some uh, charities and organizations have to do. Uh, we want to be generous in the way in which we work with uh, different organizations, different movements, pioneers out there, um, asking what, what is the sort of service, almost public service that we can provide for others without necessarily knowing what the outcome is that it will lead to, but recognizing that we need to sort of place some bets and support people uh, over, over a longer period of time. And finally, on plurality, um, we're a team that come from lots of different backgrounds. Um, we have trustees who come from lots of different backgrounds. We uh, have a range of ideological views within our organization, and we see that as a strength. We see uh, doubt and curiosity as strengths in the organization rather than pursuing a single view about the future political economy. Um, we, are, we all share certain values and principles and we share a commitment to ending poverty, um, but we recognize that uh, that is a complex question and there are many different and legitimate sources of wisdom and knowledge, both within our organization and much more importantly, outside the organization as well. So there's some of the uh, principles that, that guide us. And then just very briefly, uh, that leaves the question, so what are we actually going to do? Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, we broadly we do three sorts of work. Um, so the first insight and ideas, um, uh, JRF has been doing this for many years. Um, it's often where we're um, most recognized, where our sort of brand is strongest, if you like, um, it, as being a sort of expert um, research and insights center on issues of poverty. Tomorrow, for example, we'll be publishing our annual um, State of the Nation report on um, poverty in the UK. Um, and last week we produced reports including on housing, tenure and home ownership and affordability. Um, so we will continue to um, put forward, and I hope in, the, in future, more propositional work offering solutions to some of those deep challenges that I've been um, talking about. Um, secondly, we um, uh, run campaigns, so we don't just come up with insight and ideas, we campaign hard for them. Um, we fought hard last year around benefits increases, and just as we fought to retain the £20 uplift in universal credit through the pandemic, and later this year, we've got a major new campaign around a welfare state that supports people with the essentials, so we will continue to campaign. But importantly, um, we also want to use our position, and this comes back to our sort of power and infrastructure principles to support um, grassroots movements and others who are um, who are, are pursuing sort of deeper change, not necessarily campaigning to government in the way that we sometimes do, but building more community led uh, movements for change. And we ask ourselves, how can we best support that? Um, and that in turn links to um, the final area there, new paradigms and experiments. And I, I won't say much about this because I'm hoping this is where um, Sophia will um, pick up the mantle because the Emerging Futures program, whilst it works across all three of these areas, is probably most deeply embedded in the new paradigms and experiments. And at one level, this is a new departure for us, hence why we are building a new team and new program of work, and it's very exciting. And on the other hand, it actually takes us back to our deepest roots. Um, and the, uh, the community of New Earswick, for example, that Joseph Roundtree developed over 100 years ago, is still very much part of our organization. I spent my morning there um, this morning, and part of the Emerging Futures Program is rediscovering that sense of actually building the change that we want to see, uh, not just imagining it and hoping, but actually getting on with the work of supporting people to build it. So it's in that spirit that we've developed the Emerging Futures Program. Uh, and I'll, I think I'm now handing back to Sophia to tell you a bit more. Thanks, Paul. Um, and uh, thanks, thanks for setting up um, the uh, the next the next bit of the conversation so nicely. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just say a little bit more uh, specifically about the Emerging Futures Programme, which, as Paul says, in lots of ways goes back to our roots in terms of reconnecting with that um, spirit of building alternatives, not just writing reports or campaigning about it, but actively building the future we want to see. Um, so, Michelle, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, just very briefly, so what is Emerging Futures? Um, in, it, this is a kind of very quick summary, really, of, of, of what, what we're trying to do with the work. Um, it is in parallel with the research and the campaigning, the movement building work that Paul's outlined. But through this programme, what we really want to do is back 
the people and the organizations and the coalitions who are building uh, new ideas, showing us in practice what a fairer future might look like. And we know that there are people up and down, pioneers up and down the country who are doing this work. And our task, we think, is to um, find those people and move money uh, to their work so that they can continue to grow it. Um, we think as well as doing that work of, of kind of backing the pioneers and the pathfinders who are already building those alternatives and showing what's possible, we also need to resource work, which is about growing hope and possibility. And in lots of ways, this is really about um, uh, uh, doing work and supporting work that is about engaging directly in questions around the nature of our economic models um, and to explore what alternatives might be. And we're interested in work that often has a slightly different starting point that is rooted in concepts of solidarity, liberation, interdependence, um, work that often really brings together kind of environmental, economic and social considerations to think about the transition. Um, and of course, as well as backing the work, we really want to think about how do we build a stronger, deeper movement of change makers and visionaries and pathfinders. So lots of the people who are doing this work, building the new in the context of the old at the moment, talk about feelings of burnout, exhaustion, constantly having to kind of fight to not get pulled back into the status quo. And part of what we're trying to do through the Emerging Futures program is I guess grow that sense of collective endeavor, that this is a collective endeavor. And um, we need more people involved. And so kind of really expanding that sense of what's possible. Um, if you go to the next slide, please, Michelle. So um, what does that translate into? Um, so um, we, we have, we've talked about this work, we've been in development, I'll say a bit more about the work we've been doing over the last 12 months to de develop the Emerging Futures Programme, but we have positioned the first two years of the work as a kind of initial learning cycle, um, and that's because we are working on the basis of the best knowledge we have, but we also know there's a hundred questions we haven't yet answered. Um, and so these are, these are our kind of best bets, I guess, of, of how we might enact some of those intentions I've just described. We've created uh, four tracks of work um, and we are planning uh, through each of those four tracks, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute, um, to uh, move money, uh, to build coalitions uh, and to learn. Um, and, um, and those four tracks are, are the ones on the screen here. So if, actually, if I start with Pathfinders, the third one along, um, this is really uh, the track where we want to be finding those social pioneers who are out there doing the hard work of building alternatives in their communities, showing what's possible in practice. We really want to resource that work and amplify it. But we also recognize that alongside that practice and the, the kind of practical uh, sort of exemplars of, of what alternative futures might look like, we think we also need to invest in some ideas. Um, and that's where the visionaries track comes in. We really want to make sure that we are backing work that is about growing ideas that can orient our perspective to something different, that take us beyond the way things are now um, and that open up new possibilities that draw us away from the status quo. So we have a track around that. Um, thirdly, we have a track around imagination. And I think the simplest way of explaining this is that this is about investing in work that grows hope in communities and bringing some rigor uh, and um, some, some new practice to how we go about that business of growing hope in communities. So there's a growing network of imagination practitioners out there, We're very keen to be working with them to think about how might we grow that sense of hope and possibility, expand that field of what's possible in communities. That's the third track. And then the final track, and Paul's kind of alluded to this, is around reimagining philanthropy and investment. We have to recognize that in many ways, philanthropic organizations, the way in which we depend on endowments and investing in global uh, equity markets and so on, are part of the problem. And unless we start thinking about the way that money flows in philanthropy, but investment more widely, we aren't really engaging in, in, the, in the depth um, that we need to be. So we have a track that is very explicitly about how might we reshape philanthropic and investment practices. Um, and that's a very important part of uh, the next two years. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So in terms of what we've been doing, so I mean, I joined JRF uh, about 16 months ago and have been in a very intensive development phase uh, since, since joining. I guess beginning with that question of how might a philanthropic organisation play its role in speeding up the transition to more equitable and just future? That's a big question to ask and we really didn't want to sit around in our offices thinking about it. So we've had a, a pretty intensive um, uh, 12 months of um, asking that question with as many 
people as we could um, who could bring something important to to that to, to answering that question providing insight so just just to, to give you a sense of what we've been doing we had a co-design group and I've listed the, the people who were involved in that all of them bring expertise in sort of what you might call transitional work thinking about how do you how do you move forward to a future um, that is uh, to, towards a, a, a new future, alternative futures. Beyond that co-design group, though, we engaged with a very broad range of people. We were looking for people who are already building alternative futures and they're thinking in practice. We we're looking for people who are thinking very systemically uh, rather than about programs or projects specifically. We were looking for people uh, who have not benefited from the status quo. We we're looking for people who are every day having to imagine alternatives because of the way um, they're experiencing the world today. So it's marginalized communities, wide range of people from uh, marginalized communities in every form, but also um, specifically people who have direct experience of poverty. Um, and huge thanks to uh, colleagues in our participation team for, for facilitating some of those conversations. Um, we also were talking to people who are operating across a huge range of approaches to change. So taking account of movement building, creative and cultural work, research work, systems change, healing and restorative work, really trying to take as broad a perspective as possible, as well as people working across a wide range of issues that, um, that, that you know, where change is very likely to be needed. So housing, land reform, governance design, work, youth justice, that list could be a lot, a lot longer, but I just wanted to give you a, a flavor of it. Um, and then if we could just go on to the next slide, um, a little bit more, we've, we've, we've basically, we've run a lot of workshops, we've conducted a lot of interviews with, with that range of people. But actually we also didn't want to sort of sit in silence and wait until we kind of figured everything out and then, and then pop out with a program design because the truth is I don't think we're ever gonna figure everything out. Um, we, are, we are moving forward with, with the knowledge that we have. And so over the year, we've also been trying to um, put together people and ideas and start sharing things that signal uh, the scale of our ambition and our intentions with the programme. So um, if you haven't already had a look, I really suggest you take a look at some of the things on this slide um, to give you a sense of, of, of what, we're, what we've been thinking and doing. Uh, last year in July, we had the New Frontiers Investment and Philanthropy Conference, which um, over 900 people attended. All the content uh, is, is online um, and I recommend a, a a cup of tea and, and, and a bit of time on, on the YouTube channel with that. And we also have a community of interest, um, which we've got 700 people signed up. We've held some, um, some gatherings um, so far, and we're just thinking about where to take that next. We've been doing lots of speaking uh, and participating in discussions that other people have hosted as well, as well as sharing the kind of evolution of our thinking as openly as we possibly can. And then finally, also offering direct funding as we go. Um, so there's a lot of criticism at the moment about foundations kind of redoing their strategies and in the process, pausing all funding programs. We've really tried not to do that and to continue to move money uh, as we're doing this thinking. So just listed a few examples uh, on that slide there of, of the kind of kinds of people we've been resourcing uh, over this year. Um, I'm going to keep moving because we are getting quite short of time. So um, just the uh, next slide, we'll, we'll make sure that we share these slides with everybody afterwards. Um, so um, apologies for the speed that I'm whipping through them, but um, do, do please um, look at them at your leisure uh, later on. Um, in terms of the difference we hope to make, I'm not going to run through all of these now, but I suppose that the, the thing to say is we are thinking about the first two years of the programme as a kind of initial cycle. Um, we there's a total budget of of around about eight million um five million five to six million which is about uh, uh grant money to, to 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 put into other work and then the remainder for us to spend on commissioning convening and curating um there is a wider commitment um to um putting um between 50 and 100 million pounds of our endowment in service of this kind of work over the next five to ten years we don't know exactly, and I've seen there's been a few questions about this already, we don't know exactly uh, what the kind of budget uh, uh, sort of pattern looks like after these first two years, deliberately because we want to learn from the first two years about what we should do following, but there is a very firm commitment to that money, um, that increase in resources um, for the remaining eight years of this coming decade. Um, 
So in terms of the difference we want to make, and it, certainly in the first two years, we're talking about building greater resilience of other people um, who are working uh, to build alternative futures. We want to make sure we are moving money to marginalised individuals and communities. We want to make sure we're expanding that sense of what's possible. Um, and we want to grow the field of funding for this transformative work. And I think that's very important. We know we're not alone in asking some of the questions we're asking in the Emerging Futures Programme. There are some other funders who are thinking in similar ways. And I think one of the things we really want to learn about over the next two years is, is, is what might we do together with other funders? What, how could we collaborate to expand money that's available for this kind of work? Um, right, let's keep going. Um, in terms of where we are now, so um, we're recruiting for this role having already made a start. So I want to be upfront about that. There are some things that are kind of committed and in place. So we've agreed a budget for the first two year learning cycle, as I said, we've already moved some money um, this, this year and at the end of last year um, to uh, organizations. There's obviously a lot more money that we still have yet to move in 2023 and, and again in 2024. Um, we are beginning the process of co-designing um, the additional support we might offer to Pathfinder organizations that we've funded, um, but we haven't concluded that yet. And um, we've identified partners to work with uh, to support some of the specific elements of our work. And we will be selecting um, a couple of other partners to support specific elements of our work in the next quarter. So before this recruitment is concluded. And we do also have uh, the next, next Frontiers Conference booked for June and, and are beginning to curate that as well. Um, but there's still plenty more to do. Um, so on the next slide, just um, uh, there really is an awful lot more to shape. We really need, and this is a big task this year and something that's going to be essential uh, to um, this role, we need to do a lot more work around the governance and decision making for uh, the Emerging Futures Fund to embed equity and transparency in everything we do. Um, these are questions that many funders are asking. We have lots of ideas and insights um, that have been gathered over the last uh, 12 months, but um, I think this is the year now as we kind of move into sort of delivery that we really start, we need to enact some of these um, some of these processes around what does our governance look like? What, what, what is our decision-making process? Who is involved? And so there's a real opportunity to shape that work. There's lots more design work to do on the different tracks that I ran through earlier um, of the work and, and kind of really shaping them. We, they're kind of ideas and possibilities with some rough ideas at the moment, there's more to do. We need to deepen and develop partnerships with other funders and investors. We need to think about our learning and how we communicate that. So what, are, what is it that we want to learn about this work? How do we communicate it? And of course, we need to build this incredible team um, of which this role is part, um, but we're going to be going out to recruit the other roles over the next month. And um, we've got to build an incredible team that's diverse, that embodies the value of, of this work and is really set up in a way to fly um, as, as we get moving on the programme. Um, Final, final thing, I just want to acknowledge the ongoing questions and challenges that we have. Um, uh, we've talked about this a bit already, um, and maybe it will come up in the Q&A, but you know, we are trying to do this work from within a, an established philanthropic foundation with all this entails. Now, we're very lucky. We've got a very supportive set of trustees, and we've got some really exciting new appoint appointments in, uh, in the kind of investment side of our work. Um, uh, within the foundation side, we've been doing a lot of deep work around um, our anti-racism, both of inner work and also organizational work also work around class diversity so so there is lots of work on the issues that might otherwise make it very difficult to do this kind of work from within uh, a philanthropic foundation but it's still hard um so just to be honest about that um we still have these questions around governance and decision making processes as i said and of course there's this whole question of how do we know that what we're doing is the right course of action in the context of the sort of uncertainty and the lack of a blueprint that we're working with we're not looking at evidence-based programs that we roll out we're saying we're having to work in bets and probabilities and emergence and so it can be very hard to know whether what we're doing is right um, and that can make it tricky when you're trying to um, persuade others to back the program um, I'm going to stop there and I think that is the end of our slides but what I'm going to do now is just hand over to Seppi um, to say uh, a little bit about the experience of working at JRF. Seppi. Thanks Sophia. Hi everyone it's lovely to I guess not meet you, but be here. Lovely to be here. Um, thank you all for coming. I joined JRF, I think it was about seven months ago in the summer last year, um, because I saw the job post on, on the website and I just thought, oh my God, this program is incredible. It's unlike anything I've seen before. And truly reading the documents 
give me a sense of joy and um, just, yeah, opportunity for positive change. So my experience thus far has been really positive. I think everyone is really passionate, committed, actively working every day tirelessly to tackle poverty and create a just future for, for people. And I see this all the time. I think people are so, um, yeah, like engrossed in the work and really in, in it, like so knowledgeable, so passionate. And I love speaking to people about it and everyone's really happy to share. So I think it's a great place to work. I really feel fulfilled, which was really important to me when looking um, for a job, a place where I feel like the time and energy we put in the work we're doing, because we're working so much of our lives, needs to be a place where I can like get that fulfillment. And I truly, I do feel that. And I'm not just saying that because of, of, of this. I, I do truly feel that. Um, and I think that there's a lot to learn. We're in a process of transition. So less learning, reflection, Sometimes when mistake making is a, a part of the job, but I think particularly within JRF, within the Emerging Futures team, there is um, a sense of, of understanding that that's, that's okay, that there's trust that I can put forward ideas, I can put forward a reflection and it will be heard, it will be thought about. Um, and that's quite unique. I think this is it's a very special organization to work in, work for. And particularly, as Sophia um, mentioned earlier, the anti-racist work we're doing, the class diversity work we're doing, really clearly there is time and energy being put towards tackling these issues that are so, that are structural, but do affect our organisation, but we are actively working to counter this. Um, and it's not just talk, it's really happening. And I think that's really important. Um, for, it was really important for me. And it was very powerful to be in those uh, in, in these anti-racist workshops we were doing, really powerful for me. Um, I think the the organisation and particularly Emerging Futures is a very curious workforce. I think the, um, both in the leadership and in, in the non-leadership teams, everyone is reading and trying to think about different ways of tackling poverty and how to improve their work and how to move forward and do different things. Um, and again, this is this is crucial because the issue, the place we're in now is because of things haven't things haven't changed. People things haven't moved forward, um, and we need to change this. I think that's all I'm going to say, because I, I implore you to apply. I implore you to join. It's a wonderful place to be, um, and I look forward to meeting one of you, perhaps if the person who's chosen is here in the future. Thank you, Seppi. Um, that's great. Really appreciate it. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so I think what we will do now is just um, I'm going to say a few words about um, the team uh, and the role uh, and the process. But I'm going to, again, be quite quick on this because I can see lots of questions coming in um, in terms of the team. So um, you um, if you were successful in uh, getting this job, you'd be joining a team of eight that includes Seppi and myself. Um, there would all, there are also going to be three fund leads, one of whom is appointed and two um, who we are seeking to appoint um, and that will be going live um, tomorrow, uh, maybe even today. Um, and then we're also recruiting a learning manager and a design researcher. So that will make up the core Emerging Futures team. We're nested in obviously a much bigger team at JRF um, and we have lots of support from our colleagues in uh, the insight and policy teams uh, and um, uh, the analysis team and the communications and public engagement team. Um, diversity uh, in, in the Emerging Futures team is really important to us, just as we believe that there is not a single future. So we believe we need to build a team that brings many perspectives, many life experiences. Um, and we are really committed uh, to, 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 to making that happen. We're working with um, uh, a a fantastic organization called Radical Recruit who are helping us to expand um, our reach in terms of who we are hoping are going to apply for these roles um, and we're doing everything we can to make the process as accessible as possible. If there are things we're not doing that you feel we need to be doing please let us know and we'll do our very best to accommodate um, those things. Um, and the other thing to say about the team is we really want to make quite a deep investment in the team culture. One of the things I say a lot here is we have to be the work as well as do the work. And so actually 50% of that learning manager's role will be focused on the team itself, how we um, design the sort of processes, practices, rhythms and culture we need 
to support the sort of work we're doing through Emerging Futures um, and how we create uh, a team that um, is, is centered on learning, uh, curiosity, inclusion. Um, so, so these issues are very, very important to us and um, we will be looking to you as the Associate Director to really champion some of that work. Um, in terms of things we're looking for generally across the team, um, I wrote a blog, um, which hopefully you will see, have seen. If not, we will get the link out to you um, after this when the recording goes out. Um, but really, we're not looking necessarily for people who've got specific sector experience. We're looking more for people who can bring some of the qualities we think uh, are needed for this work. So an appetite for working with uncertainty and emergence and co-creation, a healthy risk appetite whilst we're having some respect for rigor, but a healthy risk appetite, an ability to think in terms of systems, real systems, not programs, a kind of building mindset. So people who are keen not just to sort of challenge, uh, but also to come up with propositions, think about what, it, what would we build, what would we build to address these issues, and a really clear commitment to equity um, and a deep awareness of uh, power um, and privilege that you can show um, in your own uh, lives and work um, and that you would bring to the team. Um, so those are the sorts of qualities we're looking for. Um, in terms of the role itself, we're, as I say, we're not looking for people who've necessarily got lots of experience in philanthropy or investment. Um, but there are some things that uh, we are needing. Um, so first of all, you need to be comfortable working in a very fluid and fast changing environment. You need to be OK with sort of uncertainty and iteration and co-creation. You need to enjoy those things and and feel very energized by them. You'll need to be a great figurehead for the work, um, both um, both sort of publicly, but internally also setting direction, bringing people with you. Um, you need to be very. Um, you need to be dem demonstrably passionate about equity and racial justice, and able uh, to show us how you enact um, that passion in your own life. Um, you'll need to bring a level of ambition for the work um, that really recognises the scale of change that we think we need in this moment we find ourselves in. Obviously, you'll be managing a team, um, but actually, in addition to that team, you'll also be working a lot with kind of external uh, partners. Uh, and, and others. And so you'll not only need to be a great manager of people, you'll need to be a great partner and collaborator um, and, and skilled in kind of commissioning and convening and, and all of that as well. And then finally, you'll need to be up for playing a corporate role at JRF. Um, as Paul talked about at the beginning, we are um, attempting, um, we don't know if we're going to pull this off, but we're attempting to become an organisation that works across multiple timeframes and horizons. And so uh, in this in this role, you'll be playing an active part in our corporate life to really think, how do we do that? Because we don't know, we're working on that one. Um, so um, that, that's, that's, that's a bit more about the roles. I'm happy to go into more detail if, if you want. Um, process wise, um, uh, the application deadline is uh, the 12th of February, which is sun a Sunday. We'll be shortlisting uh, very soon after that. And the shortlisting will be done by a team in JRF, both the People team and the Emerging Futures team. We'll be uh, doing that shortlisting blind. In other words, we won't see uh, CVs with names, dates of birth or any other information like that on it. We'll also be shortlisting uh, by uh, questions that you submit. So you've been asked to submit questions. We'll be looking at those first and, and, and scoring them. Um, we intend to shortlist no more than five or six applicants and we're, we will be letting those successful applicants know uh, by the end of uh, Wednesday the 15th of February. Um, that will be the point at which we'll also let you know a bit more, more information about um, the process, um, any preparation you might want to do. We will be sharing information with um, successful candidates about um, the types of questions we'll be asking at interviews so that everyone can come into that interview and give their very best um, uh, in the conversation. Um, the interviews will then take place um, in our London offices, which are in Borough, on the 20th or the 21st of February. February. Um, and we can pay for travel and accommodation. Um, if required. Um, I think that's everything I need to say. Um, oh, sorry, one other thing. Um, on the interview itself, it will be a diverse panel of three or four people, some of whom um, will be uh, 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 from within JRF and some of whom will be external. Um, and again, we'll, we'll be able to confirm the, the, panels, uh, the panel um, makeup with candidates who are successful um, on the 15th. Um, there may be a second round of interviews and it will depend how the first round go, um, but we'll keep we'll keep you posted on that and the final selection will be made after that. Um, we'll be able to give feedback to people who are successful in getting to interview. And so that's that's um, that's what we'll be able to do on the feedback front.
I think that covers everything that we felt would be useful information for anyone who's interested in this role. So I think what we'll do now, we've got about 20 minutes left for questions. Um, so, and I think, Seppi, uh, you are going to turn into the questioner, aren't you? I am indeed. Right. So a few questions were submitted to us um, earlier. We're, we've sort of like gone over them, plumped them together so we can cover as much ground as possible because we are a bit short on time. So Sophia, question one. Where did the initial inspiration for Emerging Futures come from? Gosh, I mean, there's inspiration from everywhere, right? I mean, I think, um, I guess, I guess the, the, the starting point was a recognition. Maybe I'll just say something personally. Um, before I joined uh, JRF, I was working um, at a, a charity which I'd set up in London called Little Village. Uh, and we were like a food bank, but for baby clothes and toys and equipment. And we worked through COVID, demanded doubled. Um, and I remember very clearly just feeling at the end of that period that, um, it wouldn't matter how, how, how hard we worked, what, how, how much stuff we were supporting people with, the scale of poverty and inequality was so deeply systemic that, you know, we organisations like Little Village could work 24 seven and, and, and there wouldn't be enough difference made. And so a sort of recognition that the, as, as Paul was saying earlier, that the sorts of um, drivers that are continuing um, that are leading to continued poverty and deepening poverty are so deep that unless we're willing to engage in some of those kind of questions around our economic systems, economic paradigms, we aren't really going to shift the dial um, at all move towards the sort of future uh, where um, people and planet can fl flourish. So that's, I guess, just where I'm coming from in terms of the inspiration for the programme. I mean, there are so many people who I think um, have inspired some of the work that we're doing. Um, so uh, I'm just thinking in terms of um, uh, some of the uh, pioneers out there in the UK um, who are already doing this work. Um, many of you will be will know of some of the some of some of these organisations, Civic Square, Onion Collective. We can make um, some amazing organisations that are showing us what's possible. I guess stepping back, I think other inspiration, Bell Hooks, and the way she talks about love as a driving force of change. Um, uh, Jane Engel and her work on sacred civics uh, and the commons is kind of amazing and, and beautiful account of what do we value and what's important. Um, Johan Schott and his work on deep transitions is really, uh, really brilliant. And again, if you haven't looked at that, I recommend it. And I think um, the last person I mentioned is Adrian Marie Brown um, and her work on emergence, which I think is so powerful and such an important thing to be looking at. But yeah, inspiration is everywhere, I think, but there's a few examples. Tough question to start with, but thank you. Next question. Generally, how willing are you to take risks and what does this mean for JRF? and the organisational readiness? Okay, um, I mean, I think we are as willing as we can be to take risks. Um, I, think, I, think it's, I, I think the work we've done with the trustees over the last year really means that we're in a place where there is a recognition that in this part of the organisation, um, our risk appetite is high. And in fact, the biggest risk is not doing enough. Um, I don't know, Paul, if you want to come in at all on that, but it does really feel like there is a genuine commitment to um, experimentation, trying new things, um, accepting we might get a lot of it wrong, but that is still valuable work uh, on behalf of the, the sector and, and, and philanthropy more widely. Yeah, I mean, it, I'd, I'd agree with that. It, it feels very much like that to me. We've had some really good conversations with trustees over the last year um, you know like any organization we have a set of regulations we have an audit and risk committee but we're we're having really uh I don't know, really fruitful conversations about we, we we can't draw a straight line from the sort of investments we want to make here to particular outputs this is speculative work we're placing bets but actually we have an obligation as the you know this is not a luxury this is an obligation on an organization like ours given the position we have um that we've got to get into this work because if we don't who, who else is going to get into this work and we have to be willing to shoulder more risk than we have done in the past and that's not true of every bit of work that we do um but you know as Sophia says the the, the biggest risk we face in some regards uh, particularly in this area of work is that we we hold our risk appetite too low um and we don't don't push ourselves uh, and, and including challenging 
ourselves on what are we and what do we stand for and those questions around philanthropy and how far are we part of the problem these are if we're not getting into those questions we're not doing the work I move on next question is more of a on a practical on a practical note do you speak about like the the work balance is it in york is it london opportunity for flexible working job share even sure um so um we are pretty um flexible on all those sorts of questions um we want to get the right person into this role and are happy to work with people um, to figure out what that means in practical terms. Just to give you a flavour of how things work now at JRF, um, we have, uh, our team is sort of split across three main offices. So we've got um, our HQ here in York, where I'm sitting. Um, we've got our London office, which I'm guessing is where Sefi's sitting, although, yep, yep, there's a, Sefi's in our London office. We also have an office up in Glasgow. Um, and um, like many organisations since the pandemic, we've also taken a much more flexible approach to hybrid working. So um, we've just introduced a, a sort of pattern, not required, but where we say we're going to make we, we designated Tuesdays and Thursdays as our office days we encourage people to come in because people have been saying how nice it is to socialize and spend time with colleagues it's not required but we, we're getting into a bit of a pattern I guess there of, of people coming into one of our offices on those days um, but we're very flexible um, about that um, and, and, and can make it work. Um, in terms of um, flexible working Sort of within the role and in relation to hours as well as location that's absolutely something that's very important to us i was in a meeting the other day with about 16 people and we established that all 16 of us are working flexibly in various different formats and um, so there's you know i think probably as many different forms of flexible working as there are people at jrf so yeah that's absolutely something we are open to a conversation about thank you next question is more about those who, are, who we are funding um, what will what and how will JRF ensure that those who are funded are representative of our society who are diverse um, and how are they and how will they be able to contribute to this work? Yeah, OK, in a way, that's a question I turn back to whoever gets this job. Um, we've got a lot of thinking about that. And obviously, there's been a lot of work in recent years um, within the kind of funding community to think about how do we open out um uh governance you know it can no longer be a bunch of um uh kind of very similar looking uh mainly white mainly male mainly older trustees sitting around the table making decisions about what work matters we've been having a lot of really important conversations this year about the kind of uh, knowledge that gets valued um the kind of voices that are being heard um, and, and who gets to sit around which tables. Um, we've got lots of ideas on how that translates into our fund, and we're definitely um, thinking about how we embed different aspects of participatory um, approaches into um, the work of the Emerging Futures Fund. But I would say that there's still a lot of work to be done. One thing I'd say, transparency is everything here. So um, that for me is a very important principle for this work, that we are working in the open, that we're being absolutely clear about the decisions we're making to do things in certain ways and can explain why we're doing it that way. And that we've taken a very clear kind of equity perspective um, in all of our decisions. So um, it's a, yeah, there, there, there are many ways, but the commitment and the principle that, um, that, that people from all sorts of different communities, life experiences are involved, not only in being funded, but also in the decision-making process is a very important part of this work. It wouldn't be credible if we didn't put that at the centre. Thank you. Next question. Um, could you please say more about the regional and place-based work that is um, like referred to in the organisational structure diagram? Yes, um, it's, it's um, <laughs> a slightly messy relationship and also one that is evolving um shall we say um so actually the regional team is is a relatively new um uh, a new part of the the organization at jrf we've historically you know we are based in york we're, we're unusual in that we're an organization based in york um uh, in in this kind of field um and and we made a decision last year to really kind of i guess build out our role as an anchor institution uh, in york and the region around york um and 
but we wanted to do that in a way that was, I guess, kind of really tuned into our new strategy and that has quite a strong flavour of emerging futures because uh, we, we do um, act as a funder in York. And so we really want to think about how might some of the insights and uh, learning and thinking we're doing about what does it mean to be a funder in relation to emerging futures? How might that apply at a regional level? So we have um, another associate director who heads up um, that regional work. Um, and she, um, she, so she's kind of uh, in my team, but running that work fairly independently. Um, and um, while there is quite a strong emerging futures flavour to the work that we're doing in York and the region, we also do do some other things which perhaps look more like um, more like kind of research and insight work. Um, so there's a kind of dotted line relationship, I guess, but they are separate and distinct teams. Thank you. Um, could you please speak a bit about how Imagine features intersects with the other branches of work within JRF. Yeah, um, again, <laughs> uh, this is um, something that's evolving and, and something we'd be looking for the associate director to really play a very active part in. Um, I think we've been um, really clear as we've been talking to trustees and, and doing this thinking um, uh, about what is the JRF, that, that we want to be an organisation that operates across horizons. That doesn't mean creating three separate Sort of tracks the kind of horizon one horizon two horizon three or anything like that um, we want to be bridging between some of this more kind of speculative future focused work uh, and some of the work that is i guess more focused on kind of near-term contemporary politics um, and i think sometimes it's a bit easy to sort of pose um those two things as being um in opposition to each other or kind of not compatible but i actually think the moment we're in shows just how urgently we need the sort of work we're talking about doing in emerging futures. The moment we're in is showing just how broken so many of the systems we're trying to kind of patch up are and how we, you know, we'd be crazy not to be using this moment to ask some of these questions about why is it so? And, and perhaps we need to look again at how we understand economic growth or um, uh, how we think about the concentration of wealth and distribution of it. So, um, so uh, yeah, yeah, so in practical terms, I mean, we're still figuring out, I think, how that looks like in terms of rhythms, because actually the Emerging Futures team doesn't really yet exist. That's what this recruitment drive is about. Um, I do think there's lots of shared values. The principles are very helpful. The principles that Paul run through are very helpful about kind of offering some glue, I guess, that hold the organization together. Um, and um, I'm very excited about the links, for example, with our insight and policy colleagues uh, in relation to kind of land reform, um, home ownership, ownership more generally. There, I think there are huge opportunities for collaboration there. Similarly, with our colleagues in communications and public engagement, they've been doing a lot of work thinking about how we might resource movement infrastructure, movement effectiveness, and I think that is a huge part of um, the sort of space that we want to work in in emerging futures as well so I think there's many opportunities that we can build on that we've identified. First whole ground absolutely. Uh, the next question is about whether people can apply if they live outside of the UK or um, will the work does the work have legs to be focused more on like external UK environment? So that is a great question I don't actually know the answer um, in terms of whether there are any limits. Um, so I might need to commit to come back to you on that because I wouldn't want to give an inaccurate answer. Um, we certainly, uh, it's very hard to do this work without some kind of global perspective. Um, part, of the, part of the starting point of Emerging Futures is a sort of recognition of our interdependence between people, but also between people and planet. And so a kind of global perspective is very welcome. Um, in terms of the kind of, just practical question about can people apply? I, 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 I don't know. Um, so if, if it's okay, I, I, I will commit to getting back to you on that specific question. Thank you. Sophia, what do you think is the biggest challenge for someone in this role? Um, it's a really good question. So I think, I think there are a few things. I think, one of them, one of the challenges of, is about holding on to the scale of ambition for this work um, in the context of a cost of living crisis, where it can sometimes feel like the urgent work of ameliorating the worst impacts of that cost of living crisis need to take precedence. So I think holding on to the scale of challenge, continuing to, to recognise that if we only do that ameliorative work, we'll be 
stuck in the same position we've been in with you know destitution growing inequality growing so i think yeah that that is really hard and it's something i struggle with on a on a regular basis of kind of is this right that we're doing this work when it feels like the world is burning around you um I think it is, by the way, but it's hard to hold on to sometimes. Um, I think also trying to make the case for um, this work when it doesn't fit comfortably into kind of existing mental frameworks. So it's not about a particular issue like care or housing. Um, it's not about a particular discipline like policy or research or design. Um, so I think finding a way of talking about this work, which both honours the kind of newness of it and perhaps sometimes the need for new language at the same time as doing it in a way which feels doesn't feel exclusive or 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 or, or, or alienating to people is a real tightrope to walk thank you i'm conscious of time so if we can end the question and answer portion now um we will send out a two-page document answering all the other questions that we haven't got round to um, and send that to all attendees so that will come in the following days or so. Yeah. Back to you, Paul, to, to wrap up. Thank you. Thanks very much, Seppi. Um, I, Sophia has said a, a, a lot over the last hour, but I just wanted to check, is there anything else, Sophia, you wanted to add before I wrap up that you didn't cover in the, in the questions? Um, I don't think so, only to say, um, like, this it is really exciting. It's a hard, complicated, work but it is such an amazing opportunity we have with significant resources attached to it so um i really would encourage you to consider applying brilliant um thank you I, so i'll draw us to a close if that's okay and um, just to reiterate what um Seppi said that, that there's been loads of questions i've seen them coming through in the q a i know we had loads submitted beforehand um, we've done our best to answer as many as we can in a relatively short space of time. Um, I, su I suspect we won't be able to answer every single question, but if there are some which are relatively straightforward, including factual questions like the, uh, the one we had about overseas applicants, which I feel I should know the answer to, and I don't either. Um, so we will need to check with our HR colleagues. Um, uh, I'm sure we can answer those in a two pager and we can make sure that um, gets out to um, all of you. Um, in addition, if there are further questions, if there are questions that you asked, which um, you, we weren't able to answer today, um, and you really want an answer, uh, or any other burning questions, then uh, you can email us, please do email us, um, hopefully I'll get this right, um, people will shake their heads if I don't, I think it's ef.recruitment at jrf.org.uk, ef.recruitment at jrf.org.uk, and we will do our very best to answer any questions that um, come through to us. Um, other than that, I think it just falls to me to thank everyone for joining us. I can tell that the, there have been a lot of people on the call, not just asking questions, but also um, watching uh, the webinar. Um, I think we'll be putting a recording of this webinar out as well. So if you want to watch it back, um, you have the opportunity to do so. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. I hope it has been a source of inspiration. I hope it has answered some of your questions and I very much hope some of you uh, still want to uh, join us um, and we'll put in an application and I look forward to um, seeing people in the future. And if you do put in an application, um, very best of luck. Um, thanks again for joining us. <laughs>